evening, everybody. Welcome to our very first program of 2015. Last year, we did 40 programs. 40 programs in 52 weeks. 40 programs in 12 months. It was a rough year, but you know what? We educated many. In fact, during those 40 programs, over 2,400 people attended those programs. So that was a good thing. We felt great about it, and the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, felt great about it. And that's why they like to work with us. That's why they like to give us the grants that we need to do these kinds of programs so we count on them to be at these programs. And so for like tonight even, I want to thank our exhibitors that are here. And we have Accorda Therapeutics, Bayer Healthcare, Biogen IDEC, Genzyme, Pfizer, Novartis, Mallinckrodt, and Teva Neuroscience. Okay, so we want to thank them all for being here tonight and, you know, showing their support for our program and being here to give you guys information. Tonight's program will feature Tina Butterfield, and Tina's going to tell you who she is, what she does, and, and remember everybody, this is not just our first program of the year, but this is our first program on women's health and MS, all right? We're going to try to be doing this series in many different locations around the state of Florida, as well as getting outside the state, too. Run. Run. No, you don't have to run. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for coming through the rain tonight. I think everybody did better than me because I encountered like three wrecks on my way. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you, Stu, and Stu's staff for setting this great program up. Really appreciate it. And also all the pharmaceutical reps for their assistance in the program. So I'm talking about um, how to disclose that you have MS in the workplace, part of what I'm talking about. And the other part is if, once you're diagnosed, discussing the diagnosis with your children. So that can sometimes be a challenging part of it. But before I get into that, I want you to just kind of think about yourselves. I know I'm competing with food right now. <laughs> and probably you had to send some of it back after Megan's talk. <laughs> but hopefully enjoy the food. But anyway, think back to the time before you were diagnosed with MS. And what you used to describe yourself. How did you describe yourself? And compare that to how you would describe yourself now. Is there any difference? Um, so, you know, looking at that for all of us, what three words would you use to describe yourself? I think that's really challenging. So even for those without MS, that's a challenging thing to do. Because we're not used to really saying those words about ourselves. So think about that as you're finishing your meal and as we go through the topics. And if there's time during Q&A, we can, and you wanna share, maybe you can do that. So the three words, um, just think about that. And think about where it is that you get strength from. Do you get it through meditation, spiritual things, reading books, praying? Do you get it through your friends, your family? Probably a combination of all of those, if we're really going to be honest about where we get our strength from. And just looking at all of those relationships, and as you describe the words, or think about the words that describe yourself, use those in combination with how that has changed in your relationships with others. So the objectives of this program, we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of disclosing MS in the workplace. And I know that many of you have stories about that. I hear them quite often, every day. We're going to look at the ADA, what FMLA is, and how you, how you can use that to your benefit. Reasonable accommodations, what that is. Barriers to overcoming disadvantages of disclosing MS, 
and applying for disability. So what are some of the advantages of disclosing the diagnosis of MS to your employer? Well, for those of you who worked and didn't tell your employer or your coworkers, you know that that's quite a burden. So the, advan or the advantages are you don't have to carry that burden. So you have some peace of mind about it. And then also disclosing it allows you to um, have the benefit of all of the FMLA and short-term disabilities and long-term disabilities that are out there. And you can utilize work modifications, which will allow you to stay in the workplace for a longer period of time. And then you gain support from your coworkers and your supervisors. And one of the nice things about it and one thing that is important for you to understand is that when you disclose it, there's going to be a lot of questions for you. So you really have to be prepared to educate those around you about what MS is. So what are the disadvantages? Those are things that you can probably list very quickly. Number one, MS is a individual, can be silent disease. So from the outside, no one might be able to tell that you have MS. So disclosing that allows everyone to know when you're taking off work, they might ask more questions like, are you okay? They might be worried about you. You might not want all of that attention on you at work, even though they have you know, the best meaning, best intentions about it. And it, it can be, you know, MS is personal. And again, it's not personal anymore when you tell your supervisors, your coworkers. And again, you have to discuss it a lot, and you may not want to have it discussed every day. So I'm sure that all of you have heard of the ADA, or the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that prohibits discrimination um, in, in government places, in public places, and also, one of the things that I wasn't really familiar with was that in a private sector, if there's at least 15 employees, those same uh, laws apply. So that just means that there should be accommodations for you to get into restrooms if you're using equipment. Uh, you should be able to have transportation. And, um, you know, it also helps with, like, telecommunications for those who can't hear. And the Family Medical Leave Act, the FMLA, um, for healthcare providers, we kind of close our eyes when those come at us because um, they're often, but they're important. And if you have a chronic illness, you know, we have some people who have migraines and for them, it's important that they have FMLA because if they have a migraine, that takes them away from their job, they're protected. So making sure that you have FMLA filed is really important. And some people don't wanna do that because they think it might create more problems at their workplace, but it's really just protective. And it's also for your spouse to take off time. If you have a chronic illness, your spouse can use the FMLA um, in order to take off time to help you if you're out because of your illness with MS or whatever your FMLA is filed for. Does everybody know about FMLA and use it if you're in the workplace? Hopefully. Um, so it does help with personal and family needs. The one thing that we find is that sometimes employees don't know how often it needs to be recertified. So make sure if you use FMLA that you're aware of how often it needs to be recertified because often the employer will say, oh, your FMLA expired and you're, you aren't even aware. And so during that period of time from the time it was filed and expired to renewal, you're not covered with FMLA. So reasonable accommodations, um, that's also um, mandated that reasonable accommodations are made. And so that's different for different people. So reasonable accommodations means that what makes your work easy for you to do and accomplish 
and it's reasonable in that if you need your computer raised um, in order to use it, that that is carried out. If you need a cooling area, if you need a fan, things like that. For some people, heat is more important. You know, in this room, the majority of people are affected by heat, but I have a few that cold affects. So make sure um, whatever your need is, that that's looked at and accommodated. <laughs> so potential barriers to work accommodations. Um, you might encounter resentment from coworkers. That's always a possibility. Um, when someone takes more time off than others, there's always an assumption that they're getting some kind of favoritism even though it's not for a reason that you would want it to be for. There can be increased cost um, having someone that has a disability working. And medications, as we know, is a great cost, so insurance costs can, come up, can go up. And if the company is a small one, then that's something to consider. Um, and also, just attitudes. Attitudes um, are the big part of barriers to workplaces knowing that you have MS or any kind of disability. And a quote from Richmond was, many employers mistakenly believe that hiring a person with disability means that you automatically compromise somehow on the quality of or volume of work. And we know that those of you who are still in the workplace usually work harder and to make sure that there's no doubt about your abilities to carry out your job. So that's really a misconception and something that um, you can change in the workplace by being the good workers that you are. And just the you as someone saying that you have MS, having apprehension about it. Fear is the biggest thing that keeps individuals from uh, telling the workplace that that you have a disability, it's fear of not knowing what's gonna happen. So what are some solutions to overcoming the barriers? Well, communication. Um, when your coworkers and your supervisors find out that you have any kind of disability, and it may not be apparent, and it may not slow you down for a long period of time, but if changes are necessary to be made in the workplace, then you can show where you excel and you can maybe make changes with a coworker where you're doing something that they normally would do. So just having meetings and discussing it and kind of getting it out in the open so that there isn't a lot of talk behind your back about you getting favoritism or you having benefits that they don't have, but also in just showing that you're willing to do your part and that helps you know, overcome the barriers and creates teamwork among everyone working together. So how do you decide if it's time for you to go out on disability? What, what makes you think that that would be an option for you? Well, the healthcare provider is part of that, probably. Um, usually when you come in, you're talking about your symptoms and through months or even years, you're working on um, making changes and maybe changing medications or exercise, as Megan mentioned, um, doing things that help overcome your symptoms. And if you've done that for a long period of time or your condition has changed where suddenly you have something new like a new weakness or difficulty walking or fatigue that you just can't beat um, those are some signs that you might need to apply for disability. So your symptoms are interfering with work. You might not be able to make it through a whole day. And so the physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, all of those are important in determining that a disability might be needed. And so when you decide that and you talk to your health care provider, it's important that if you've been seeing your doctor every six months or once a year because you've been doing well and suddenly you're not doing as well, 
it's important that you have regular visits and it's all in the documentation. Because when you go to apply for disability and you aren't regularly seeing your healthcare provider, it's going to create difficulty in you obtaining disability. And, make sure, and when you're having to take off you know, a lot of time from work, that also shows that you're not able to make it through um, a complete day or week. Um, and you know, that creates the, another signal that you need to apply. So individual changes once you've decided to file disability or you're approved for disability. Um, there's a sense of loss, and you have to recognize that. If you were someone, you might have been the breadwinner. Um, you have to understand that things are going to change, and you are part of that. Um, you have to be part of recognizing the change and guiding it. So you need to reflect and plan for the future. You need to make sure that you've discussed, if you have a spouse, that you've discussed with your spouse how you can manage without your income and make a plan to live within your means. When you go outside of that, then you're creating increased stress for your entire family. But share the MS challenges and achievements with others. That's part of what you can do and what many of you do in this room by going to support groups, by leading out in support groups, by volunteering, by doing peer counseling. All of those things can replace part of the loss that you might feel by giving up your job. And make sure that you do things like you're doing tonight, get out in the groups, um, get educated, make sure you support each other. And if you attend a support group, try to have someone where you exchange numbers and you can check on each other. Because, you know, we often, when we have support groups, we'll recognize that someone hasn't been in a while and then someone will call and say, oh, where have you been? You know, you haven't been here lately. So that makes them feel part of a group and it helps you as well because you're encouraging someone else. So when we look at disclosure of MS in families, and the objectives of that. It's important to provide a united front. If you're by yourself or with, with a spouse, you need to make sure you have a plan of how you're gonna communicate it. And you have to adjust to the potential of relationship changes. Recognize that the time varies between individuals and understand how tr children learn and process information, and we'll get into the different types of learning. And use age-appropriate material. So when you meet with children, um, it's of course gonna be somewhat dependent on the children's age. But children respond to parents' emotions. So when you're upset, they're gonna be upset without even knowing why, especially younger children. And you have to assure children that MS isn't fatal. You know, that's their number one fear, that something's gonna happen to you. So provide reassurance and make sure that what you tell the children is the truth, that when you tell the truth, they can always expect the truth from you. So they're not, never gonna question what you're telling them. So if you're truthful in the beginning, they can learn that that's gonna always be the case. And again, understand that children respond individually. So one child is gonna have, they might laugh inappropriately. Um, and it might, you know, that's, they're concealing their worry and concern by laughing. And recognize that this is a loss to all family members. So age appropriate material is found uh, within all of the MS organizations. There's kids camps, uh, so for kids and parents who have MS, they go and they meet with other kids and that really provides support for them. There's all kinds of magazines um, discussing parents and symptoms and it gives pictures of different types of symptoms and what happens when you encounter different types of symptoms. There's coloring books uh, for that age. There's activity books. 
there's um, audio tapes, there's all kinds of things. And the different styles of learning is important to know before you start communicating with your children. And of course, if you have more than one child, it's probably going to be different. So using the combination of things would be important. So if they're auditory learners, then just having a conversation with them would be enough, probably. Um, if they're small, using pictures, again, in combination with the auditory is important. And visual, uh, those learners learn best by seeing pictures and by viewing images. And tactile is anything that they can put their hands on and understand uh, you know, what might happen with different symptoms. And there's some ways of doing that that I'll address in a little bit. And the kinesthetic learning is kids learn by activity. So um, I have a friend whose son had ADD, and when he was in high school, he would have a index cards, and he would read an index card and then go shoot a basket. And then he would do it again, and that's the way he learned. But if he had to sit down and learn, he, he could never absorb it. So finding out how your children learn is important. So there's going to be various emotions after the disclosure. They're going to have all kinds of questions, and it's not going to be immediate. You're going to have to understand that um, maybe even behaviors will change as time goes on. And so some of the props for children that are recommended are the same things that you've probably seen at other MS programs where um, you take Vaseline on old glasses and you have the kids wear it and make them try to do an activity like make a sandwich or read a book or watch television and apply like wrist weights when they're trying to type on a computer or text and that's really tough to do. So having them see what you might experience, some of the symptoms that you might experience is helpful in making them understand what you go through and that sometimes when you're just tired it can be from a number of reasons, but you need to also address that, that you might need naps, you might need time that you might not have taken before just to reschedule activities. Um, some people say that they, you know, instead of going for vacation in the summer, they go in a cooler time of the year somewhere so that you know, they're not exhausted by the heat. So make sure that you just look at all the options of how you can best do activities with your family. And so again, there's role changes that occur. You have to accept that the roles might be redefined. If, again, you were the primary breadwinner in the family, male or female, um, things are going to change a little bit. Your income will probably go down a little bit when you go on something like disability. Um, when you continue working, um, there isn't as much of a change, but there just might be a change in activities, such as just making sure that your fatigue isn't so great when you're working full time and taking care of your family. Again, teamwork is important and just pulling together and making sure that the house is run correctly and that everybody has a role and helps out. Um, it is recommended that children are never the caregivers. So that doesn't mean that they can't assist you in various activities, but, or in bringing you things or, you know, helping with some of the housework, but they just shouldn't be a major caregiver for you. Communication is the key. And when you, again, answer questions for kids or even your spouse, it's just making sure that they understand what you're going through, that you communicate with them. And make sure that um, you understand that the relationship prior to diagnosis will also reflect how the relationship is going to be after the diagnosis. So if communication was poor before the diagnosis, you're going to have to work even harder to make it better following the diagnosis. Find new ways to uh, spend family time together. That's put down the electronics and just have some family time. 
when my nieces uh, come up, they're 11 and 16, I always tell them, okay, when we eat dinner, you can't be on the, you know, your thumbs have to take a rest. And that's sometimes very challenging for them. <laughs> but it is important that you communicate and make sure that you're talking and not just, you know, having your kids be on one side of the table and you on the other. So make sure that that goes on. So a final thought is that from Washington Irving is that there is in every woman's heart a spark of heavenly fire which lies dormant in the broad daylight of prosperity but which kindles up and beams and blazes in the dark hour of, of adversity. And so, you know, in this room there are many women and men, but women, you know, definitely tend to rise to challenges and make sure that the whole family is, is involved. And so just, this is just a shout out to women. So thank you. So questions. Yes. Uh, Tina, I've been out of the workforce for many, many years due to the MS. But when I was working, I did have access to the FMLA practice. And so you did have to register every year. But back in 2005, you were limited to only four months of leave per year. They could be taken intermittently or they could be taken a couple of days at a time, a couple of weeks, but a total of four months per year. Do you know if that has increased or that has changed in the last eight or nine years? It seems to vary from workplace to workplace. That's what I find. Does anybody know anything different about that? Megan, do you know? What? What was the question again? FMLA, is it limited to four months a year? I Well, no, she's saying the total amount of time. Um, the total amount of time for FMLA, I think, is six to eight weeks usually before it um, rolls over to your short-term disability. But that might be very workplace dependent. That's what mine is. Yeah, I think. Yeah, so I think it, it's workplace dependent. Yeah. Yeah, it varies from place to place from what I understand. Okay, next question. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to pediatric onset MS, how some of, in cases where um, there's not, it doesn't seem to be motor impairment in a child, but rather starts from brain problems caused by MS, when they don't identify it, obviously, as a pediatric MS, is it common then for there to be a lot of complications about Di misdiagnosing in terms of there could be overlay with mood disorder or depression, anxiety, and cognitive interference along the way? So you're saying because there's a delay in the diagnosis that the symptoms may be worse? The, or? The, the child might actually be experiencing MS attacks. And not know it. Like would, could MS present as, could an MS attack actually be um, just in an area of the brain that affects the mood and causes an attack of depression or an attack of anxiety and depression? I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. If it's just, I mean, there can be, there can be a reaction to that as well. But we but, know that MS can be diagnosed, you know, as young as 18 months. Um, but there's usually a reason that it's, it's well, suspected. And, could there also be an explanation for that, that this, that MS, a pediatric MS, it might unfold so slowly that years and years and years could go by before there's actually any detection of um, yes. a spot on the MRI? Yes. There's just this ongoing kind of thing happening, but it doesn't necessarily show up a lesion. So that's what I would call an existential question. Um, and I'll, I'll 
explain that by saying that um, there's been a study in adult MS uh, that if you go back 10 years before people were diagnosed with MS, most of them have uh, insurance billing um, diagnosis of fatigue. Um, however, that doesn't mean that everyone with fatigue is going to have MS, and it doesn't mean that their fatigue was caused by MS that they didn't yet have. So in a child who's having cognitive issues, mood issues, and has a normal brain MRI, they don't have MS. Does that make sense? You, you need to have brain abnormalities on MRI to have multiple sclerosis. Well, but you, you can have, you can have uh, some MS symptoms for years before it shows up like that. It might show up in the spinal cord first before well, it shows up in the brain. Correct, if your symptoms are referable to the spinal cord. But if you're having trouble thinking and you're having trouble with your mood and you don't have any brain or spinal cord lesions, then you don't have multiple sclerosis. Okay, next question. Come on, you gotta have questions here. Come on, I need to lose weight, let's go. <laughs> One minute. Wouldn't what she just suggested be like a, um, foresight or something that the doctor may see ahead of time to, even if you don't see the signs of MS right then, it's maybe, a uh, sign that it will be coming, like... Uh, so symptoms before the diagnosis? Right, right. We don't know, you know, those, those individuals aren't really followed or evaluated, so... Question? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. That's, that's what we would call foresight or worrying about something that hasn't happened yet and might not happen. So we, there's, there's nothing that says that in people with all of these symptoms that we need to do regular screening um, to prevent a certain thing from happening. Um, whereas, for example, in a person who has a first-degree family history of brain aneurysm. Some of you may have seen the commercial on TV. There's a woman whose mom had a brain aneurysm. She went in and got screened and found out she had one. We know that screening for first-degree relatives of people with aneurysms can prevent a bad outcome for those people based on what we find. Okay, so like the outlook would be different if family history was involved to where MS went through the genealogy? But, but in, in, in MS, that's not MS. the case. So we don't, M MS is not common enough so that we recommend screening of family members. I probably used a really bad example. <laughs> so yeah. I think what you were talking about is being worried about a child who's having cognitive issues and mood issues, and could this be MS? Right. Yes, it could be that's MS. That's understandable, but even from what you were saying, what if someone in the family line, not just one person, but several yeah. people in the family line. So there, had so there are risk factors. The and they were diagnosed with it. Right, so there, so there would be risk factors okay. for MS that would, would make that person's family um, probably say, well, let's go to the doctor and get evaluated. But if the brain and spinal cord were normal, then there would not be multiple sclerosis. And so then they Even would- Even if something developed later? So, so they would treat the symptoms, and then if something happened down the road, say for example there was an optic neuritis and there was a brain lesion, then that person may have multiple sclerosis. But it still doesn't mean that their depression and thinking problems 10 years ago Actually were MS before it happened. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if I confuse anybody. <laughs> Um, the University of Miami is who? Oh, the University of Miami is doing a genetic study. Um, if anybody has gone to one of the workshops when the University of Miami wants blood samples, they'll also take it of family members. So I don't have that contact number, but um, it would be the G probably on the website. Uh, probably on the website with the University Good. of Miami. Yeah, yeah, a genetic study. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
They, they want over 3,000 people and they're only up to 1,500, so, and they've been doing it for about two or three years. So if you can and are willing to call and find out the information, that would be very helpful. And are you able to get it drawn at a local place or do you have to go to Miami? They send you actually, they send the, you a the kit. The vial, right? They'll send you, they send you a, a swatch type material. And, and you just put it on there and put it back in their envelope, self-addressed, uh, back to them, and already postage stamped. Okay? Anybody wants it, you can send me an email. I'll get it to them, and they'll respond to you directly. I will not be in the middle of it, all right? Great. Okay. Next. Thank you. I currently work full-time, but it's becoming more... I work full time. Mm -hmm. I'm a nurse. But it's becoming more difficult to get through a whole shift. I can take days off, but when, when do I know when it's the time to file for um, disability? So there's a few things when, you, when what you're doing changes or your ability to, to complete your job. You can try to do something else within your field. If there's something that you think you would be able to do in a different area, um, so that's one thing you can get some, you know, kind of quick retraining in certain areas. Or if you are unable to do your job, or even something similar that's in the same capacity as a nurse, um, then that would probably be a time if, you know, your healthcare provider agrees with that, because the healthcare provider has to assume that you're not going to be able to work. Um, like at least for a year in order to say that you're going to file for disability. So, you know, if you've been going and kind of reporting those symptoms, and if not, you should start and make sure that those are recorded. And then they have to, you know, kind of look at you and agree that when Social Security contacts them or a lawyer or whoever you go through, that they're agreeing with your decision. Cross the room. Dean, are you um, any more knowledgeable now about the GMS blood test for the biomarkers? There, there's a company called Glycomines that's claimed that it helps differentiate the diagnosis and validates and possibly distinguishes if someone is at higher risk for rapid progression. Is this being used a lot now? or We aren't um, using it. Are you, Megan? No, I've never heard of it. Yeah. I never heard of it. <clears throat> okay, next question. <clears throat> How come when I was standing there you didn't ask that? <laughs> Has there been any research or um, history uh, on, on whether or not depression, anxiety, high stress work Field, work in high stress fields um, with predating the MS diagnosis. Um, I heard Megan say that there was um, some experience in, in fatigue history being documented leading up to, perhaps leading up to the diagnosis. But when she was asking the question about whether a child could be presenting with depression, mood disorder, behavioral disorder problems that could that be masking an MS diagnosis? Perhaps what I hear you saying is that perhaps it could eventually, it, an MS diagnosis could be revealed down the road, but if there's no lesions and, and no physiological evidence or in, indicators, I, indicators of it, then it's going to be treated as an MS. When there's so many folks in this room and in the MS community who've struggled for uh, years with depression, anxiety, panic, and functioning in a very high stress work environments. Um, there's so many commonalities there with MS. I'm wondering what, um, ha whether I believe we could do a better job tying them together and sorting out. Um, perhaps some preventive, or at least raising awareness 
uh, and I, those are my thoughts, but I, I, you, you hear a question in there somewhere. I'm, I'm keep so, concerned about whether we're going to pay enough attention to that overlay. Yeah. So we know that, you know, stress affects the immune system, and I'm not sure, you know, research-wise how that would be sifted out, you know, to say this is from work, this is from family, this is from life. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, uh, as far as a, you know, research being done, but I understand what you're saying, that, you know, the stress of various things in life um, can definitely be seen before the diagnosis of MS. Well, your family might say to you, well, you, you know, you've been depressed for years. Right. That have to do with your MS. Right. Well, we all know that MS patients get depressed, but um, you know, there's some connection prior to being diagnosed. Right. I don't yes. Know. Yeah, you I think... I think the, the problem is, you know, we don't have that group of individuals, you know, prior to diagnosis. So you can't, you know, it's hard to, to be able to get that kind of study because you, you would just have to have a, a group of individuals that are depressed. And if down the road that whole group, you know, the group that was in that study became MS. You may have addressed this issue, but it's for both of you, Tina and Megan. The question is when to tell. And I don't know if either of you or both of you have talked about it, but if you're at a job, when do you tell your employer? Do you tell your employer? Do you tell your coworkers? And if you're involved in a dating relationship or if you're dating online, do you tell? When do you tell? Yeah. We talked a little bit about that with the work and the family, and I think work, it's, it's really one of those things that you have to kind of realize, do you want to tell before you're hired for a job? Um, if there's no visible signs, I think sometimes being in a job, um, it's better for them to see how you work and get to know you before you, you disclose that. Um, if it's something visible, they know there's something physically wrong with you, and they're going to always wonder, you know, what is it, you know, and assuming they hire you, a lot of times when you disclose it, if you have some kind of physical signs, if you disclose what it is and what you're capable of doing, then you're still hired. And as far as dating, um, you know, I'm, I hear various stories. I've had a, a couple of patients who have gone on dates, they have not disclosed it, before the date, they get on a few dates, and then they disclose it, and then, you know, some of them aren't called back. And then I have some who disclose it ahead of time, and then they go out, and it's better that way. So I think that's another, you know, kind of individual thing. Maybe others of you have had experience in that line. I don't know. All right. One more question, and that's it. Anybody? Does anybody want to respond to that? Dating online, would you tell or not tell? Boy, a bunch of chickens. Here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's not about dating. <laughs> I, would not, I would not reveal anything unless it was going to be something permanent between us. Yeah. Because so she said she'd happen. wait to see if it was going to be something permanent. Because anything can happen in between, and why do they need to know that information about right. you? Yeah, and I, I think if there's not a good reason to tell, get to know the person. and. <laughs> That's different. So I think you would tell, you know. Be, yeah, I definitely think you would tell. Because then they're gonna, it's just gonna be all this wonder, you know, what it is. Oh. Any other, anybody else, anybody wanna answer that? Who's here to answer that? Everybody stand up that wants to answer so I can find you. <laughs> I also struggle with telling people and not telling them at one time and at the workforce. And it became a real struggle because you find yourself lying to yourself and to everybody around you, especially your loved ones. And what I ended up doing was I tell everybody, I'm not ashamed of my disease. I didn't ask for this. 
I didn't do anything wrong to deserve this. I'm not going to hide from it. Either you love me and accept me for me with what I have, and that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to run from it. I didn't choose it. And now that it's getting worse, I'm not going to hide it even anymore. I'm going to come out with it and say, listen, this is what I have. Love me for it or leave me for it. But right. that's the bottom line. Good. Group hug. <laughs> Anybody else? That was a good question. Look at all these responses. <laughs> I just want to commend you and say amen, sister. Very good. <laughs> because... Okay, I would like to share. Um, I recently met a gentleman, and I walk with a cane. So, of course, he asked me what was wrong with me. He asked me, did I injure my back, or did I injure my leg, or had surgery? And I started to lie. But just like the, the lady said, either you love me and you accept me for who I am, or don't. So when we, we went on a few dates, and he never asked a question. And I think the fourth date, he asked me. He said, may I ask you, he said, why do you walk with this cane? And I thought, should I lie, or should I tell him the truth? And I told him the truth. And I said, I have MS. MS doesn't have me. And he told me, he said, well, you know what? He said, don't worry about MS. He said, I'm going to be there for you. He said, I'm going to be there with you. We're going to struggle through this together. He said that he is going to help me eat healthier and just to be there to support me. And I told him I really appreciated that. So, amen to you, sister. It is difficult living with a condition and especially, you know, with having someone to accept with your condition. But I just want to say thank God. I thank Megan. She's been very supportive for me. She knew what I was going through. I was very depressed. My daughter and my family. And I just want to thank everyone. But it would be nice too if we can have workshop. I mean, you know, have um, dating sites for people with MS, so people can meet other people with the same condition. Because if you're not married, it is difficult. I'm divorced. But God is good. I'm still living. I'm still breathing. And I'm going to beat MS. So just thank you, everybody. Well, thank, thank you for sharing thank you. that. Thank you. thank you. Anybody else? I see hands going up now. That's amazing. That was a good question. Did I say that already? <laughs> She's a plant. No. I'm not sure where I heard it, but when I first got... MS, I read somewhere that a significant number of husbands leave their wives when they get MS. And it's, the wives don't leave the husbands, the husbands leave the wives. And I, it was about 75%. And that happened to me as well, after 25 years of marriage. So I think it's more common than we realize. I'm, I'm here tonight because of my daughter who has MS. I'm 71 years old. If it hadn't been for her, I would have been dead many years ago. And I've had doctors tell me I had six months to live one time, and another time they told me I had a year. And all I could see was her. When she was in her 20s, she came down with MS, woke up, couldn't, couldn't talk, couldn't do nothing, just move her eyes on her, on her wedding anniversary. She got up from that. She played basketball. She mountain repelled. She water skied. She, 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 you couldn't stop her. I went to see her and pretty near died watching her. But every time I decide I'm going to give up, she's there looking at me. And it's given me the courage to get off of my butt and, and move and do what I have to do to still be here for her. And as far as marriage is concerned, NS hasn't got a thing to do with that. 
My husband left me after 36 years. I had six children I raised for him. That had nothing to do with MS. And here my daughter just got married in May. And she, I mean, let's hand it to these people that have MS and try. They don't give up. They keep pushing. They keep trying. And by them doing that, I'm not going to give up. When I go to my grave, I'm going to go kicking it in a fight. <laughs> and it's because Thank of you. Thank you for that inspiration. You got to have a martini in your hand, too. Anybody else? Of course, back in the front left. <laughs> yes, 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 I know. I know, I know. Come on, Tina and everybody who's seen me, they always know I have plenty of questions. Um, this was related to the last three questions. Okay, and you were talking about children and teaching them things like this, family support or lack thereof. What would you recommend in a case with an adult who has MS who's living single and their extended family is sort of in denial? They're, you know, the, the labs, the everything, the doctor's trips, the attacks, they've seen it come and go and this and that, but there's this kind of game where everybody's trying to play like, this isn't interfering with our lives, this isn't really painful, this isn't really scare, scaring us to death. We all have to just kind of put, pretend, let, let that person do the best they can, living on their own, by themselves, and you know, the family, when the family gets together, it's this, you know, that elephant in the room thing, or yeah. nobody seems to know what would you recommend when denial comes in to play with the family? Well, it's, it's kind of like how denial is in any situation. You know, the relationship prior to this is important. And making sure that they're educated um, with whatever means there is, the websites, the programs, making sure that maybe they meet other individuals with MS. Um, those are some of the ways. Um, you know, it's, it's basically, if it's a family relationship, it's, you know, trying to just have that relationship and hope that they understand along the way once they're educated and maybe see things that go on. This is gonna be the last question, because remember twice ago I said this is the last question. <laughs> We just need to thank our caregivers that are here and all the ones at home that help all the MS patients. Remember them. No, it's not a question. It's just something For sure. we need to thank them. To all the care partners. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Well, firstly, I want to thank Tina. I want to thank Megan. I want to thank all of you all for coming down here today. And question, would you want to see another program similarly to this? Are you going to get everybody else that you know with MS with women, women with MS, to get here and get for this program? We want to like double the size of this, all right? Okay, so we can do that. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to raffles now after everybody thanks everyone.